Uh, he, he, but he could prioritize what needed to be done, and that was an important quality to his leadership. But all of these things go into making Abraham Lincoln this mythic hero. Controversial, no question about it. Uh, somebody we will continue to debate, no, no doubt. Somebody who we will continue to misunderstand positively. Here's a man that we know a lot about that ain't so, and a man that we don't know much about that we should know. Here's a man, uh, I mean, we know the challenge of this as teachers. Here's a man who's criticized for things that aren't his fault. For example, if you look at the whole suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, everybody says, well, you know, he shouldn't have done that. He was violating the Constitution. Well, in what sense was he violating the Constitution? Not suspending the writ of habeas corpus. The Constitution indeed provides for that. But what branch of government gets to do it? It's in Article 1. It's the Congress that gets to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And in a posthumous court decision, so after Lincoln is assassinated, the Supreme Court does say that presidents henceforward will need the assent of Congress to suspend habeas corpus. That's the criticism that Lincoln did not work with the Congress. Not that, he, that, that, not that it's unconstitutional. It is constitutional to suspend habeas corpus, but who's the agent in that process? And to preserve the balance of power, Lincoln was a strong president. The Supreme Court afterwards said the president and Congress need to work together on that. So is he going to be controversial? Yes. And a lot of these controversies are because we don't do enough reading. We don't understand the history well enough. And our job as teachers, of course, is to get out there and make sure that some of these controversies uh, are at least informed if you're going to enter the battle. And of course, because I am a Texan and a Southerner in sensibilities, I was raised with a, a lot of um, anti-Lincoln rhetoric growing up. But you know what? I, I ran across, I'm going to leave you with this little personal story. I don't very often tell you to tell audiences personal story, but I had the occasion to see one of my childhood pictures recently. You know, in the old days, uh, classroom pictures, they still do this where they take the whole class, and we're all sitting at our desk. I was in the front row, and I had a book underneath. And so I'm a six-year-old kid with this book underneath, and I couldn't, you know, so I took out the magnifying glass. Here's a six-year-old kid in Houston, Texas, southern city, before, and this will betray my age, this is before the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. So I'm living in a Houston in which there's separate water fountains, separate facilities for black folks and white folks. And what was that book? As I magnified it, it was Dolaire's Lincoln. Mm. And so already, as a six-year-old kid, I was, I was reading Lincoln in, a, in hostile territory. <laughs> <laughs> he attracted me then, and he attracts me today. And uh, I hope you've caught the fever. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, yesterday oh, he was referred to as a deist. And I think I was watching PBS on Lincoln and they were talking about the evolution of faith in his life. Um, could you kind of give us a quick summary of how that plays out as far as... Lincoln was probably very much a non-believer as a kid or certainly a skeptic. We would call him a skeptic because some of those little... Uh, stories that he would tell while his, his legs were woven into the, the fence rails were making fun of the preachers and the absurdity of the universe, no doubt. And he'd get kids to laugh uh, at miracles and things like that. But there's no question that suffering and going through the life he lived, and then by the time you get to the second inaugural, there is no question that this is a man who in some sense is a believer. He believes in providence. Uh, it's mysterious to him. He's not a churchgoer. He, he's not somebody who would sign up for a denomination. But his, his religious faith is a matter of fascination, I think, for people who want to plumb the depths of this man and try to get to know him better. He was saying, I've looked for what are the hints of a growing faith? And I've looked for the hints. And in the, I believe in the Peoria speech and in some of the speeches of the 1850s where he's wrestling with the expansion of slavery into new territories, you do, say, you do see Lincoln saying, if we don't resolve this, it's in the hands of God. I would argue 10 years before his second inaugural address, where he talks about an inscrutable God, I would argue that already in the 1850s, 
he's wrestling with the mysteriousness of providence. He, he knows or he senses that he has a special role in this world and providence put him in a place to do something at this crossroads, east, west, north, south that I spoke of. But he also believes that about his country. I mean, he really, you, you can tell that, that there's, this, there's this divine element in it that's very important to him to get right. He knows that both sides are praying for victory in the war, but he knows that neither will be granted fully their wish uh, in their, their most heartfelt prayer and the groanings of the Holy Spirit, or however he would have thought about that interiorly. But we just know that, that he struggled with this, and it's one of those questions, you know, we imagine what Lincoln would be like, what would we notice about him? Is he sort of a cross between Ronald Reagan and George Washington? Or, I mean, how do we, you know, the jokester on the one hand who puts you at ease with stories, but something, something remote about him that's hard to penetrate. But on the other hand, um, I guess the question I would have, if he had lived longer, if he was somebody who could have written his memoirs, say, what a literary work. We have Grant's memoirs that came out of this period that Mark Twain helped Grant on. What if Lincoln had had the opportunity to write memoirs and settle some of these questions that we have had about him? Now, of course, he would have been a great editor of his own work. <laughs> I'm sure he would have colored it and told stories better than they actually were in the, the happening. But one of the questions I would have had was to put to him was his, his, his religious struggles. I think they were profound. Did he ever comment on Darwin's theory? Because I know it had just come out. Of yeah, in the 1850s. 1850s. That's a great question. And I think the editorial cartoons poking fun at him that made him into a baboon, yeah. those were comments yeah. that probably were colored with a little bit of Darwinian theory about Abraham Lincoln. But I don't, I'm not aware, and I'll have to go back to Michael Burlingame's exhaustive biography to see if I could find something. Very good question, since they'd be contemporaries. Yes, Greg. A question maybe on leadership. When we talk uh, today about uh, George W. Bush, um, uh, there's some talk that perhaps in the future we may look back and think of his leadership differently as though leadership can be reappraised or revised, which would suggest that in the moment, maybe leadership is not self-evident. When you, when you look at Lincoln and leadership, um, and I can anticipate what you'll say based on, on your presentation, but is leadership under Lincoln both self-evident in the moment as well as uh, receiving a positive reappraisal as historians look back at him? Is, is, there, is, there, is that a useful way to consider leadership? Can, can leadership be reappraised where I don't have it, it's not self-evident, but yet be regarded differently? 